Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Marketfy. We have Gary Kaltbaum on the line. He is president of Kaltbaum Capital Management. He also has a radio show, The Investor's Edge. Gary, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for coming on. Right in the heart of earnings season here. And uh, just give us your overall assessment so far. Things are looking pretty good. Well, uh, I, I think what you've had is beat the number. Uh, earnings have been coming, uh, estimates have been coming down for the last couple of months because of slowing economy. So you got, it's easier to beat the number and you're getting some of that. For me, the big story is Asia and Europe right now. Their, their markets, for lack of a better word, is sizzling. They have a monetary policy right now that should have been around in 07, 08, not 2015. And it's just juicing markets left and right. Our market is actually the lagging market right now as we sit range bound, but I have a sneaking suspicion any more strength around the world that we're going to break out of this range uh, 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 come soon enough. Yeah, it sure looks like that in uh, today's session. Um, our prior guest, Adam Sarhan, made a comment that you like to follow the institutional money. And, uh, you know, first of all, I mean, it's very interesting that we're the following the big money. How did you come about that? And, and what's, your, what's your method for following the institutional money? Well, all, all you want to do is, uh, you know, you want to follow, you, you want to learn what works in the market. And uh, people like Bill O'Neill have taught about the uh, v importance of volume. It's really the juice that uh, uh, gets markets and stocks moving. And I am always looking for companies that are showing great volume moves to the upside, light volume moves to the downside. That shows you institutional buying, institutional support. Uh, you don't need to call a hedge fund or a big. Uh, mutual fund to find out what they're doing. You could just see it at the bottom of a chart with a big line uh, sticking out uh, in the air. And I can tell you, uh, nine out of ten, every big winner out there every uh, in history has started with a big uh, jump in volume, either on a daily or a weekly basis. So uh, uh, on a, uh, my scans start with price and volume uh, uh, every day. And conversely, if you see the volume kind of taper off, too, after a big run, uh, you know, does that prepare you for a little bit of a pullback or, or vice versa? Yeah, but, the, but after a big run, of volume tapers off, and, but price acts properly, uh, goes up 10%, pulls back 3 or 4%, and volume contracts, that's all good news. It just means the, uh, the stock is petered out, uh, and it doesn't mean sellers have got the upper hand. It just means the, the buyers are out of the way for right now. That settles down for a little bit and then turns up again. And what we typically look for, and, and we live by it, is the 10-week slash 50-day moving average for pullbacks. Uh, it is the place where the big money crowd stands up and defends it. I, in my uh, office, I have charts, uh, 50,000 charts printed out going back 30 years, uh, studies of this, and it uh, works just uncannily throughout uh, uh, good markets and bad markets. So we're all constantly uh, looking for names like that. And, uh, by coincidence, or not by coincidence, uh, you had a lot of stocks pulling into the 50-day moving average on Friday, and it looks like they held pretty well. Okay, and uh, any just some in individual issues that have been meeting this criteria as of late? Well, my uh, growth stock list right now uh, gets headed up by Netflix with that big, gigantic gap up uh, on its earnings report. I wish they had better earnings as earnings were down, but the market's looking uh, forward, uh, so that's right up there. Monster Beverage, uh, which has had a series of moves to the upside and literally sit tight uh, for a few weeks and then moves to the upside, what I call them stair steps up, that's on the list. Harmon Industries is another HAR, which came right off the 50-day moving average in the last couple of days. The, just keep in mind, some of these report earnings real soon, and that could change the playing field. But there's enough out there that's working pretty well. Uh, and just keep in mind, things will tend to change during earnings. What's been great may turn bad. What's been bad may turn great, just depending on uh, how the market receives the earnings. So uh, take your time, go slow, and I'm never an advocate to buying right before earnings. No, wait, wait for the dust to settle. Uh, Absolutely. You know, the worst performing stock on the Dow Jones the last two years, IBM here. Uh, technically, you know, tried to go a breakout yesterday. Uh, good, good numbers on the top line, missed on the bottom line. Big volume yesterday on an update. Give us some back. Is uh, 
What's the institutional stance on IBM? I mean, we know Mr. Buffett's in there, but uh, what else? What's your take on IBM? The only good news I can give somebody who's looking at it is that it seems in that 155, 160 area, you got some pretty darn good support over the last uh, six months. Uh, my biggest issue with IBM is their uh, accounting uh, and how they engineer around it. Uh, again, uh, and I've been talking about IBM for two or three years about their accounting. You have an issue here where they report earnings that were up 9, but revenues down 12%. How does that happen? Major buybacks, lower tax rates, uh, all kinds of things they do every quarter. But you can tell on a relative basis over the last year, just very weak stuff in comparison to the market. And that's because their last two quarters sales are down 12%. So basically, the stock's off my screen. And one gets to wonder if it's so weak in a strong market, if we ever do go into a bear market again, what probably leads down, I think it's going to be a stock like IBM. Unless they uh, come up with the splitting the company, which uh, there is potential for that. Same with GE, another lagging type stock that all of a sudden they're starting to look like they're getting rid of the parts, so that's starting to act better. So I think there's a case for IBM to do some of that. But as far as right now, it's pretty much off my radar. I need companies that are growing their business, especially on... Uh, uh, the sales front and IBM just not does not foot the bill. Uh, you mentioned GE there uh, had the big boost uh, with the news selling off some assets. Uh, yeah. Now it's just kind of like giving it back here. Uh, Twenty seven was the low on the day uh, of the uh, of the announcement. Uh, really, it's been down really every day since then, except for one now. Bearing down on the twenty-seven dollar level, should investors hop in here? Or you think there's a chance to come down and fill that gap under twenty-six? Well, uh, let me just say this: I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you just realize they are getting rid of businesses because they kind of, sort of need to. They're trying to uh, enhance shareholder value to a certain extent. They think that's going to do it, and so far it's helped. It's normal to rally up and pull back like this. I think the stock's acting okay, but again. My major point is I am looking for those companies. A great example is like a Chipotle, and that's not a comment on whether their stock does well this afternoon on their earnings. But here's a company that's growing their sales, uh, you know, 25% year over year, earnings 40 to 50%. And that may change down the road as they get bigger, but these are the kind of companies I clamor for. The ones when you go into a Chipotle right now, there's 30 people in line. That's the type of thing I look for. So. A GE really doesn't work for me, and IBM doesn't work for me. Uh, but that said, there are some bigger companies out there, which I, you know, like a Disney acting great. Uh, up until recently, a Costco, which I, which is not acting great anymore, so it's off my screen. Uh, but there's plenty out there that that are doing well that you can ignore the uh, IBMs and the, and the like. Great point there. Go, you know, go where the growth is. Don't go where it was. Uh, got a question. And by the way, that that's just because in the studies of going back a hundred years, you find those great companies with the strongest growth rates and the ability to grow those rates for as long a period of time. And I will show you the biggest winners throughout that uh, cycle. It's time and time again. It has never failed. Uh, but just always keep in mind that those growth rate markets will top on the strongest number they've ever had because that could be the peak in earnings. So you always have to be on the game and watch the stock price first uh, because growth rates will top out three months to six months after a st stock is finally done with its big move. Okay. Uh, I mentioned um, Amazon to uh, to Adam and you know he said that uh, you like to follow that stock. Are, are the big boys buying Amazon here ahead of earnings? Uh, it, it sure seems like. Look, I call Amazon the Teflon uh, stock in that they can report losses every year, year after year, and the market just doesn't care because they continue to grow their sales. The valuation is out of this world, uh, but the stock is acting well in here. And I mentioned the 50-day moving average a few minutes ago. You can see on Friday's nasty pullback, it stopped dead its tracks at the 50-day, and now we'll uh, await earnings. I believe they're slated for to have some losses, but that has never stopped the stock in the past. 
uh, and so far so good. And for me, I watch an Amazon because it's a big institutional favorite. It tells me whether there's risk appetite uh, out there, and uh, so far so good. But right now, I do nothing. I wait and see uh, what the earnings are and how the market accept it, uh, accept it, and then I'll uh, make decisions uh, after that. Okay, I uh, got a question coming out of the chat here from Rob Hood and uh, Quest Diagnostics. I don't know if we've ever talked about that stock in the show. DGX, give us a take on that. Well, first off, you got to go with the sector first, and medical stocks still acting darn well. Managed care, medical services, medical parts, and the stock is just acting very, very well right now. They report, I believe they have not report yet, so yeah, if you're looking to buy now, I'm definitely waiting, but this is a bullish uh, stock for the better part of six months. I believe it has a, a cousin company, and that's LabCorp, symbol LH, that it looks exactly the same. If there's any chink in the armor, it's very slow growth now. Uh, it's uh, in single digits. I'd rather see double digits, if not more. Uh, so that would be the, my only worry. Uh, but right now, stock's acting fine. And I would say if you have it, you keep it for right now. But uh, if you're looking to buy, you've got to wait for earnings right now. And I would say that about a lot of companies. Okay. Um, also, uh, due to report today, uh, Yahoo, uh, been in the trading range here. Any thoughts on Yahoo? Uh not really. Uh, they, the <laughs> business is not growing. I think uh, the stock ran into October, living off of Alibaba. Uh, I, I, I'd call this uh, a nothing stock, if you ask me, in that it's, re- it's not in a bull market. It's, ha- it's kind of holding its own. But the bottom line for companies, if you're not growing your sales, typically your stock's going to end up going nowhere unless you're a big restructurer and your earnings start popping because you get rid of a lot of people or you shut a few plants or things like that. So not a big fan right now. And again, earnings coming out, and I'll say that probably 2,000 times in the next two weeks because there's 2,000 companies reporting. Let's see what they report. Let's see what the market does with it. But for me, again, they have shown no ability to grow the business uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, And for me, it, it gets disqualified unless that changes. Okay. All right. Uh, talking about uh, sales and growth, I know you mentioned uh, Apple before. Just again, uh, launching the uh, Apple Watch this weekend here. Earnings coming up uh, pretty close, too. Uh, what's your take on Apple? Uh, look, they're going to they're gonna continue to grow their numbers off their phones. The, the, believe it or not, the iPad's not doing as well uh, as of late. Uh, they may need to come out with a new one. As far as the watch, I think it's going to help, but I don't think it's going to be the big driver. Uh, my only worry on Apple is that they had a gargantuan number uh, in December off of the new iPhone. I gather that's going to be a peak for now as far as the earnings rate of growth as well as sales. I'm not sure how the market's going to react to it once they report next week. Uh, but keep in mind, this is the institutional darling. This is the place where the market gets in trouble. Institutions that, believe it or not, will tend to park their money into it because it's very low beta and trades 50 million shares a day so they can easily get in and out of. Uh, but I have no complaints about it. I have a small position right now and it's still hanging in there just fine. As long as it stays above 120, as far as I'm concerned, technically, I think it's in good stead. Uh, the first line of support would be the 50-day moving average, which is just below here. But for me, the 120 would be the real important number. Okay. Um, let's take a look at uh, some other big stocks. Uh, you know, the oil stocks make a big part of the index, and they've seen it come back a little bit with the price of oil. Uh, let's just take a look at a couple of the big boys here. Uh, Exxon Mobil has had a nice recovery from the lows. Uh, you know, we're your growth criteria, numbers criteria, where does um, ExxonMobil fall? Uh, well, I can tell you the whole oil complex is not in the uh, growth uh, realm right now, and that's because earnings are going to fall off a cliff here uh, because of lower oil prices. Simple as that. Uh, commodity companies uh, uh, and their stock prices are based on the price of the commodity, and when you have your commodity drop 50%, you're going to pay a stiff price, and that's why you've seen oil stocks in a bear market. Uh, I, I don't have a great opinion. They, they, right now, they're in the midst of recovering. That's all I can say. 
And when I say recovering, after 40%, 50% drop for a lot of names, uh, Exxon less because it is the lowest beta name, so it'll go down less and it's a bigger name. Uh, but I'm, just, uh, I'm not in there accumulating any shares right now. I want to see some retesting, uh, and I need to see uh, you know, currencies change a little bit. Uh, if, the, if the dollar stays strong, I don't think oil oil's going anywhere to the upside. We'll have to see uh, the dollar get weak uh, before. Before that occurs, and I and I haven't seen that just yet. Okay. Uh, anything else that's fallen into you know to your gross sector you know radar here? I mean, I'm not going to ask you about stocks that I know aren't growing or flat anymore. You can, uh, well, you can ask me about anything. Uh, the uh, big thing out there, and I've been talking about this a lot. This is just a word of caution, uh, and I have put out reports on it uh, ad nauseum. There are now been 140 biotech companies that have been brought public over the last two to three years with no sales. Now, notice I didn't say no earnings. I said no sales. That is going to be a disaster in the making once the bubble bursts, and it has not happened yet, meaning they can still double and triple from here. You can get a $2 billion market cap biotech with no sales double. We saw it in 99. I'm just letting everybody know when the music stops, valuation and value will matter. The curtains will come down, and all these biotechs that basically uh, some of them are not even, aren't even in stage one uh, for their drugs, uh, and they're still trying to develop drugs and have these valuations. There's going to be some heck to pay. So very important that all your listeners and viewers pay attention if they're in that uh, space, because again, once it ends, it is going to end badly. And some of these stocks, just on precedent, we've studied this uh, intensely many hours. We've gone back to 99 and other bubbles. They will drop a 50, 60, 70, some 80%, if not more. So just be very careful. Right now, they're still acting fine. And I wouldn't doubt that they go higher uh, first, but uh, we're paying close attention for the day it ends, because I think there's going to be a very, very very great short opportunity uh, when the time comes. And are you talking, I mean, there's a lot of them that come public and they're different, but you have companies like, uh, you know, Biogen. I mean, what, you know. No, this has nothing to do with Biogen, Amgen, Celgene, Regeneron. I'm talking about the companies that have come public that you've never heard of. When you go look at their sales and earnings box, you not, not only see your gargantuan losses, you see not one sale, not one dollar, which means they're burning through cash. You're seeing a ton of secondary offerings out of these companies because of the burning through cash. And the only reason they're able to do the secondary offerings is because investors are still clamoring for them, and that's why they're still able to bring uh, some of these companies public. And I've gone in-depth into some of these companies to see what they have. Some of these companies are years away from even having a drug, and they're trading with a billion-dollar market cap with no sales. So to me, that's where, besides the bond market, which is the biggest bubble in history, the mania right now is in the no sales biotech. So just be careful. Uh, but we will alert everybody on radio and in our reports uh, when we think the times come. We're not sure we're there yet. Okay. Uh, you just made an interesting comment there about the, the biggest bubble in history, uh, the bond market here. And oh, I'll yeah. Just go the basis. That, I mean, do you, do you think there's just a bubble because of the amount of people invested in the bond market? Or do you actually think interest rates are going up sometime this year? Uh, central banks have spent 14 to $15 trillion buying their own bonds in order to bring interest rates down. They have killed the two-way trade in the bond market. Uh, I am seeing prices, especially in the junk market, that are just ridiculous. Companies that used to yield 9% are now yielding 4%. You have countries that are debt-laden up the wazoo that have negative interest rates. And if there's anything we know on Economics 101, the more debt you have, the more you have to account for it when somebody lends you money by paying them a higher yield. But all these central banks have gotten in the way. Now, they may go to $25 trillion spending uh, to keep interest rates down, but I eventually that is another place where the music's going to stop. Things will get normalized, and I think uh, you just got to be very, very careful. Uh, I would not go long in buying anything. Of course, you can't even get anything uh, if you do. Just be very careful. When you have central banks spending all this kind of money, eventually that's going to end. Uh, maybe it's two years, five years from now, but when it ends, I think it's going to be a doozy. I, uh, that, to me, is where uh, the most gargantuan bubble we have ever seen, hiding in plain sight.
Okay, and boy, that that could be bad for the market then. Uh, eventually, but again, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, for me, as far as markets, two things have to happen uh, for me to get really bearish. Number one, you got to break moving averages, first the 50, and then the 200-day, which is the long-term moving average, and then we have to lo- lose what has been leading in the market, and that hasn't happened either. And that is the semiconductors, the biotech, and a lot of these growth names that I mentioned. If we start losing them, uh, then we'll start talking. But so far, all all corrections have been nominal, to say the least, uh, and uh, we're, we're going to ride this thing out uh, for all it's worth, uh, but uh, keep it a close eye because just remember two things. We haven't had a bear market of consequence in six years, and we haven't even had a correction in two and a half to three years, uh, and that's because of central banks, and uh, that's to be watched closely because I think the next time down uh, could be a doozy. I don't think we're there yet. Okay, we've been on the line with Gary Kaltbaum. He's president of Kaltbaum Capital Management, joining us here on Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Great, Gary, great information. Thanks for coming on. We'll speak to you again soon. Appreciate you having me. Thank you.